So we're going to move straight on to talk around uh, the uh, very interesting and important topic of accessibility. And uh, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, Linda Ristan, who is our manager in our external affairs team, but she is the coordinator of our accessibility program. This is her area of expertise, and uh, she's going to give you a quick presentation, and then we'll take some questions. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it gives me uh, immense pleasure to bring you uh, with me um, through the journey of, of accessibility today. It's our first time that we present this topic to, to you, uh, so stay with me and um, let's start. Okay. Well, where do we start? We start with uh, some basic and important fact. Um, according to the WHO, uh, the, uh, that is the World, World Health Organization, uh, there are one billion of people that live with some form of disabilities around the world. That is uh, about the 15% of the global population, and this number is expected to increase over the, over the years. Why this number is increasing? This is increasing because the population is aging. This is increasing due to the rapid spread of chronic diseases, but also is increasing because state regulators and the society is looking at new definitions and uh, new measurement of, um, uh, of disability. So, for example, they are looking at aging population, at dementia, at um, autism, and even more. Not all disabilities are visible. It is estimated that 70% of those disabilities are actually invisible. So it's a lot. And uh, this number we said is expected to increase because also aging population is included in, in that number. The population of the world is, uh, is aging and the way that people are aging is, uh, is not compared as we are used to see uh, um, old persons. Um, myself, when I will retire, I will. Uh, I want to travel the world, so I hope I will be able to travel the world. Let's look now at the international political context. So, when we started this journey, we didn't look only at um, statistics, but we looked as well at what, which political instruments are there. So, if we see, we have we have three main. Uh, um, um, three main uh, international uh, um, uh, treaties as well. One is the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That is the most ratified convention all over the world, with 177 states um, uh, signing and adopting this convention into their national legislation. When we go to uh, aviation, the International Civil Aviation Organization as well, has is Annex 9 related to the facilitation for passengers. Uh, annex 9 is related to facilitation, it is to an annex to the Chicago Convention, but this also uh, looks at standards and recommended practices to facilitate transport by air for persons with disabilities. And finally, very importantly, we have the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Those goals were adopted by the UN Nations in 2015 and in many of the goals we see reference on, um, on disability and accessibility. But mainly the, the goal that speaks to accessibility is the goal number 11, the target 11.2, that looks at and calls the international community to work towards sustainable transport for all people, including persons with disabilities. In addition to those global standards, we have also governments. Governments have to cascade uh, the UN Convention into national regulations. So they have their own regulations, which is dictating also how airlines accommodate passengers with disabilities. Unfortunately, each government has its own approach, resulting in different legislations and creating some confusions for passengers and their lines. But we will look at this more specifically later on. Um, 
I would not go into the details of these slides because you have received a presentation on the passenger's journey, but I wanted to bring you to look at some of the gaps. It's not really so bad because the gaps are not really so big in regards of how we accommodate and facilitate travels for passengers into brackets normal or for passengers with some form of disabilities. However, these slides tell us uh, some important, gives us some important indications as, for example, how we can make sure that all people can use our booking systems. Are our booking system accessible today? How we can make sure that we make all our passengers through the security lane in a seamless way? Are we making this today? Maybe we need to improve and many others, like for example, uh, when we, we talk to, to, to some of the passengers, they say, you know, we are not really able to walk uh, up and down the aircraft uh, stairs. So how we can make sure that we, can, we make this uh, accessible for the future? At the end, how we can make sure that we make aviation accessible for all? This is what we, we looked at when we started uh, uh, taking over the accessibility file and really making some, uh, thinking to making some changes. We realized basically that we need to think about the industry from a broader context. So, why this is important for the airlines? Why this is important for aviation? First of all, this is the right thing to do. It's a human rights, we have to get this right. Then we have seen that more and more governments are adopting regulations into their national, are adopting national legislations. So, and we know that aviation relies on the harmonized regulatory framework. So, airlines and passengers know what to expect. Today, as I said before, regulations are not harmonized. And both passengers and airlines do not know when, uh, which, which regulation and to uh, abide to when traveling between different, uh, different jurisdictions. Just, give me, uh, just uh, let me give you a few examples. In the United States, for example, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, has banned gas supply of oxygen on board while this is still uh, um, allowed in Canada. But more than that, there is not a universal definition of disability. So some regulations still talk about passengers with reduced mobility, others look at disabilities, others look at uh, identify different kinds of disabilities, but this is not homogeneous. So those are some of the challenges. But we know also that providing good services to this growth market makes good business sense. And there are some researches on this. Like, for example, here I have the research of the American Institute of Research who is looking at the spending power of adults with disabilities. And they have realized, and we are realizing, that actually those passengers, those persons, are not traveling and we are losing a significant chunk of business by not making a travel accessible. So again, we need to make this right. So what are we doing? We realize that we cannot look at this topic only from one perspective. There is no single approach. We have to look at it from a multi-layered perspective. We cannot just look at policy or procedures or simply talk to ourselves we need really a multi-layered approach. First of all, what we did, we reached out to passengers and the disability communities. Because if we don't ask them what they need, how do we improve for them? We need to ask, so we reached out to them. Then we have developed some resolution, core principles, approached the international community as well, and this year the ICAO assembly, but let me go through this. First of all, the AGM resolution. Uh, the AGM, um, the resolution was approved uh, uh, unanimously 
uh, this year in, uh, in Seoul. And this resolution uh, contains a set of core principles that is the mandate of our members to uh, promote inclusiveness and universal accessibility. So through the resolution, we shifted from a concept of disability into accessibility. So from a, a medical concept into a social concept to promote accessibility for all passengers. Not only for those passengers who have reduced mobility, so physical disability, but for those passengers who have hidden disabilities, so less visible disabilities, for aging population. So all passengers have the rights of seamless and dignified travel when they come on board. Then the resolution contains a set of core principles that talks to policy and procedures. For example, in the principles, we are looking for a common definition. So we are asking states to come together and start defining what disability and accessibility are. We are looking for harmonization of state regulations and for a consistent global approach and mostly for collaboration between state regulators, industry and passengers. We are asking state regulators to consult us and to consult the passengers before the legislation, when the legislation is uh, uh, under development and views can be taken on board. And finally, the international reach. So international reach not only for, uh, for us, but also for the, for the society. Let's work together, we will do better. Finally, this year we launched, we launched for the first time ever the IATA Global Accessibility Symposium. The scope of the symposium was to call together all industry stakeholders. So not only airlines, but also regulators, international organizations, technology providers, we called in the, in the room disability association and so on. With the symposium we finally shifted from disability into accessibility but also sustainable development. Sustainable development was one of the big topics that, uh, that were discussed. Sustainable tourism as well. And uh, we wanted to introduce a sense of mutual accountability and uh, cooperation within, with, uh, with everyone. It was the first ever event dedicated to accessibility in air travel and we had a lot of discussions of various kinds, not only on policy, but we looked as well at the technology. At the technology that exists today to make the air travel of passengers with disability independent, autonomous, and the technologies that can come into the future. So that we can, be, we can continue really to be the business of freedom and that we can give the, the freedom to passengers to, to travel safely and with dignity. And finally, <laughs> um, there is a lot of work in IATA in regards of wheelchairs, wheelchairs in air travel from the different perspectives. Uh, first of all, in regards to the damage rate of mobility aids. This is an important topic. The industry wants to address it, and we are doing it. Uh, the da a damage event can be a painful event for a passenger with mobility disability because uh, a mobility aid is basically constituted uh, uh, their legs. So, um, is the extension of, of their bodies and is essential to their autonomy. So we have already uh, developed some guidance in regards to the safe and secured loading of mobility aids into the cargo hold of the aircraft. But we realize that we need uh, still to improve the handling practices and to review and create new standards for the, for the loading of the mobility aids. There are also technical work underway to encourage certification in respect of the design of the mobility aids that are fit for air travel. 
So the tar the tar fit to be loaded on board, to be loaded in the cargo hold of the aircraft, because mobility aids today are not conceived to to go uh, in the, in the hold to be loaded. And this will be really a key uh, working area in the, in the years to come. In regards of wheelchair assistance, um, one of the topics that, we, uh, that has been uh, very often discussed is the assistance provided to, uh, to passengers. And um, uh, the high number of wheelchairs request uh, as, um, to, to, as a way to navigate through, uh, through airports. So what we did with IATA in 2018 and 2019, we launched a survey uh, with our members and we asked why passengers who are not disabled, who are not really, could, really define, uh, could be really defined as mobility disabled, are still in need of using the wheelchair as, as assistance, as a way to navigate through airports. Uh, we received interesting uh, results, like for example, uh, um, there is a bunch of um, aging people, old people, that use the wheelchair assistance to navigate big airports. Some of those persons get lost. Uh, I can tell you, I got lost, I don't use the wheelchair, but I got lost uh, at an airport because airports are becoming big. So there are some people that really need, uh, need some support and today the wheelchair is the one size fits all. There are some people who start travels for who start travel for the first time. So they, with the migration, uh, people have migrated from one place to the other. So they, their parents go and visit their children. So they don't know the language. They don't. The best way to to receive assistance is the wheelchair. So there is a lot of these reasons. So and what we are doing here, we are. Uh, using those results to um, target our, our advocacy at specific markets where we recognize that the number of wheelchair requests is, uh, is higher and also make recommendations about how to offer a better service because wheelchair is not always the better service to our customers but also cater the needs of those passengers who are not disabled but still need assistance of uh, wayfinding assistance at the airport. What we did already with this, um, uh, to, to gather more uh, data, we have been held uh, workshops in Ethro, uh, Delhi and uh, JFK more recently uh, with the representatives from regulators, airlines, uh, disability organizations, airports and uh, wheelchair providers. To, to assess which are the current realities, which are the challenges, but also which opportunities are ahead of us. What about the future? This is what we did. Where are we going now? Okay. First of all, we will continue driving regulatory consistency. You remember before I talked about the ICAO Assembly. Uh, at the IKEA General Assembly this year, IATA presented a working paper where we, where we requested not only regulatory consistency, but where we requested IKEA to initiate a robust work on accessibility, because uh, there is a lot to do, we want to do this uh, together. Uh, IKEA has taken uh, our, uh, some of the recommendations of our paper on board, so we expect more consistent, uh, um, consistent work uh, in the years to come at the international and multilateral level that this is what we are asking. Finally, we have some own works to do. So we are working to make sure the standards and processes are fit for, for the purpose so we are looking at our standards, we are looking at some new processes to make air travel for passengers with disabilities more accessible and seamless. And um, I think I have mentioned this a few times during my presentation. We are engaging with the disability communities, we will keep engaging with them also in, um, in, different, um, um, in different parts of, uh, of our work and um, 
And uh, but especially because by engaging with them, we don't assume what they need, but we know what we need. But also we make them part of our operational realities. Some of, uh, of the persons we do my, have spoken in the past, they, weren't, they were not aware, for example, that um, there are some instances where, like for example, when we, we load a mobility aid in the, in the cargo hold of the aircraft, sometimes the door is simply too narrow, the, 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 the wheelchair cannot go through. They were not aware, so we, we could do some work together with, the, with some regulators and so on. And finally, communicate, communicate and communicate. This is very important. In the past, we haven't been so good in communicating. We will do better. We, for example, um, we will make sure that um, all the stakeholders are aware of what we do. One of the things that I was said I was not aware is about the IATA Resolution 700 that is related to assisting passengers with disabilities. I didn't know, but this resolution actually came into force in 1952, making IATA one of the first industries to address the needs of passengers with disabilities. Since the 1952, a lot has happened, so we need to get up to speed. But we will continue communicate and also campaigning. Always, you know, what you see here is um, uh, um, is part of, uh, is uh, one of our campaigns uh, where we welcome and we make aware passengers with hidden disabilities that they are welcomed on board. That we know that we are not perfect, but we are working all together to to make a transport more accessible. And I think I've almost concluded. So to conclude, persons with disability are important to the air transfer sectors. We, want, we are committed to make air travel safe and dignified for them, but mostly we will continue to, provide, to promote inclusiveness and universal accessibility for all passengers. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.